Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, mysterious voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out of the ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Today, I want to talk about a book that I read, and boy, is this probably going to be one of my longer videos, because just look at all of these notes that I wrote for this specific book. Lots of ideas, and that usually means that I either really hated a book or really loved it, and I think it's probably the latter today. So today I'll be talking about a book about... Uh, theater and relationships and weird stuff like that. I am referring to At Night We Walk in Circles by Daniel Ehlerkon, uh, a book that is fascinating and one that I picked up from my local library. Don't forget to patronize your local libraries. For those who don't know, Daniel Ellercon is a primarily a writer. Uh, he's a Peruvian writer, and I think he's the first Peruvian author I've talked about on this channel. Uh, he's written uh, books and short stories, which I would be interested in checking out. This one, this one was written in 2013, so one of his later books. Um, I think he had he's gotten one published since then, which again I would be willing to check out. Uh, he's also written for The New Yorker. Uh, he primarily writes about uh, Latin America and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, quite an interesting interesting person uh, and quite a, a fascinating writer because he does write about Latin America. And uh, in this book, he's, he's writing about theater versus real life, um, I believe. And he, he, he incorporates unusual perspectives in this book, which I think... Um, I think you'll see as, as I talk more about it. Um, I am going to clarify, I will spoil this book. I don't know how to talk about it without spoiling it because it's a very unusual book. Uh, so if you, like, I'm, I'm strongly recommending this. So go out, read the book, and then come back to this video. Um, otherwise, you're going to have something pretty amazing spoiled for you today. Uh, but without further ado, let's get to that story. I will do a summary, a little bit of an analysis, and we will move on from there. So at night we walk in circles is told from an unusual perspective. It's told in the first person style, but it's told from the perspective of a character that we don't meet until like the third act of the story uh, and who only has like like a handful of pages that where they actually exist within the story. Otherwise, they're telling it from some future event after something has happened. We don't quite know, but we're getting more details as the story goes on. And so the the first part of the story takes place in in uh, in, in the past in in in, a, in an unnamed South American country uh, uh, during a time of civil war. There is an acting troupe called DC Embray, which is uh, putting on shows still and and just you know, being bold in the face of of corruption and the government and whatnot. And it's being led by Henry Nunez. Uh, they decide to put on a play called The Idiot President, which is about, you know, stupid leaders in general. But the current president in this regime uh, takes offense to it. And so he gets in, Henry imprisoned on on no charges at all, but then later gets, uh, gets them bumped up to terrorism charges, making it very difficult for him to actually get out of prison. Uh, and so he spends a great deal of time in prison um, and eventually gets out. Um, but his life is greatly changed and he, he moves away from acting. And then years down the road, his friend Pata Larga um, decides to kickstart a revival of the idiot president. And Henry has agreed to come on as uh, as the the president in, this, in, the, in the play, while another character, Nelson, is playing the president's son in the story, another big part. Uh, and so uh, here we, we learn more about Nelson and his role in the story. We learn a bit about his backstory, including that he's very close to his mother. His father recently died. Uh, he's been thinking about going to the United States for quite some time, but uh, recently because his father died, um, he, he feels that no one would be there for his mother. Uh, he, he's not very close to his brother Francisco in the story. Um, and there's also Ixta, who is Nelson's girlfriend um, in the early parts of the story, although they later break up uh, because Ixta feels like Nelson isn't giving her enough attention 
um, or that he's too focused on his acting career um, and doesn't know how to, you know, like be real, be honest with her. There's a lot going on in that relationship, which I urge you to read because I'm not doing it justice by, by talking right now. Um, anyways, um, as rehearsal goes on for this play, they're about to embark on a large uh, countrywide tour going into the, the Andes Mountains and uh, uh, dealing with, the, uh, de- dealing with the, the, the people of the countryside who might not like this play so much. But they're rehearsing, and Henry and Nelson begin to fight, which Henry attributes to him sort of method acting because he wants to get in the, the mindset of the president and his son who have a bad relationship in the play. We also learn about, about what's going on with Henry at this period of time in his story. Uh, Henry went to the prison, and like he developed a, uh, a relationship, a gay romance with uh, his fellow prisoner, um, although he, didn't, he decided not to call it gay at the time. But they developed a romance and uh, like eventually like the government like attacked part of the prison during an uprising and Henry uh, Henry's lover Rogelio ended up dying. And so um, like Henry's being forced to relive all this as he puts on uh, the, the idiot president play and it's sort of making him harsher to deal with. Uh, they end up uh, officially going on tour, and the show is a bit of a success. Months pass, and things seem to be going well. Uh, Nelson begins to feel a little homesick and feeling like he should reach out to Ixta. And when he calls home, he learns that Ixta is present, pregnant. Um, although she claims that the child is not his, Nelson believes the timelines add up that the child is indeed still his. At the same time, Rogelio is looking at a map and notices that the, uh, a nearby city is the city where Rogelio grew up. And so he decides to go and visit there, maybe to find some resolution with the feelings that he's, that he's having that are, that are returning to him. Uh, he ends up finding Rogelio's family, including Rogelio's mom, who has dementia at this time. And uh, he's like, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss about everything that happened to Rogelio. And it, this upsets Rogelio's mom because she has dementia and she still thinks that Rogelio is alive in the United States. But it turns out that, you know, shocker, he's dead. And uh, Henry apologizes, but this, this upsets Jaime, who is Rogelio's brother and also a drug dealer. Um, pretty aggressive dude, and he ends up uh, attacking Henry, demanding that he apologize to uh, 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 Rogelio's mom because she, uh, like, because she didn't need to know this information before she died. Uh, and when Henry goes to apologize with Nelson and Pat DeLarga, uh, Henry's or uh, Miss, uh, uh, Rogelio's mom recognizes Nelson as Rogelio. And so ha- Jaime essentially comes up with a deal that he'll pay Nelson to pretend to be Rogelio for a short period of time. And Nelson decides to go along with it um, initially, uh, which leads to Henry and, and Pat DeLarga deciding to go home. And Nelson has a, a good time as Rogelio. He, he believes that he's acting again, uh, performing the role of Rogelio. But again, he calls home and has a conversation with Ixta, and it seems like, like he wants more than, uh, than you know, he, he's real ready to commit now. And um, like he, he decides, okay, I'm just going to go back to the city and have a conversation with Ixta because we need to settle this, this, this thing about whether or not the child is mine. And um, in the process, he accidentally, like, like he, t- um, like, um, Rogelio's mom believes that, like, oh, this has all been a lie. This is ac- isn't actually Rogelio. She falls over, hurts herself, later dies, but this isn't due to uh, Nelson at all. But Jaime uh, sees this as Nelson's fault, so he sends some of his like gangster friends to go beat up Nelson back in the city, not really intending anyone to die. Uh, so um, Nelson gets home. He spends some time at the Olympic, which is Pata Larga's theater, um, and he, he hides out there because he senses that he's being followed. He ends up having a conversation with Ixta, which seems like he's ready to commit and like Ix still wants there to be something, but ultimately she senses like everything will be better with Mendo because he's not as flaky or anything like that. Again, I urge you to read the read the story to find out more about this relationship because I'm not doing it justice here. Um, and again, the narrator notes that around this time uh, Nelson is probably being followed. 
And at the same time, Mendo finds out from uh, from Ixta's job that uh, Nelson has been hanging around, and Mendo kind of assumes that they're they're doing something behind his back. Uh, and he even confronts Nelson at the uh, at the theater, and then they go to a bar where Nelson kind of insinuates that the child might be his, which causes a big fight. And they leave um, to go down a, a a street in the city that nobody else is on. And the narrator notes that nobody quite knows what happens here. But from Nelson's point of view, some like gangsters showed up and started attacking who might have been Jaime's men. Um, we don't actually know for sure, but uh, Nelson ended up running away. And when he came back, he saw that Mendo wasn't there. And so he thought Mendo escaped, but it turns out Mendo actually died. He was stabbed to death. Uh, and so the uh, like Nelson goes home thinking nothing of it, um, but he later shows up to uh, Ixta's apartment, and the police are there, and like he's like, do, do you know Mendo? And Nelson's like, oh yeah, I saw him the other day. And so uh, Nelson is arrested, and the judge th- uh, basically says, you did this crime, we're going to charge you for it. And he gets sent to the same prison that... Henry was sent years ago, collectors. Um, and uh, it's at this time that the narrator once again becomes a, a character. Like, they were already a character when, when Nelson was in uh, the town where he was playing as Rogelio and they briefly met. But uh, the narrator eventually got a job at a magazine and they, uh, they eventually learned about Nelson's story and they remembered him. So they decided to do their own research, uncovering all these stories and interviewing everyone uh, in the story. Eventually, the narrator decides to visit Nelson in prison, where surprisingly, Nelson plays up this facade as a bad guy and is kind of mad at the narrator for telling his story without her without without his permission and uh, the, the Nelson just decides to take their recording equipment and the narrator is sent out back into the prison like um, dealing with all the noise that's going on and so that's where the story ends on a bit of an unusual note there in terms of analysis, there is a lot to talk about here. There is just so much like that Daniel Ellercon like layers within this story that is just so brilliant and, and wonderful. I, I first want to talk about the characterization. Uh, like Daniel Ellercon like does a wonderful job of building up these very real, like very in-depth characters in a way that like that I haven't really experienced all that much. Like there's there like a lot of our authors do a great job of building up characters, but I feel like Daniel really excels here because he 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 builds all these characters up. Like Nelson, for example, like we're told his story through somebody else's lens, so we don't truly know what's going on with Nelson. But the character that's being described by all of these people is is someone who is so committed to acting who doesn't really know how to not do that because we uh we see throughout the story that like he he see he views things as opportunities for performance uh whether it be this uh this acting job that he's taking on or even when he um when he performed as rogelio uh like he like he believes this is an opportunity to to practice his skills and whatnot he he doesn't really see the reality of the situation until it's too late and so like Nelson is is a very complicated character, but again, we're only seeing him through the eyes of other people, and we're, we never truly learned who Nelson is, and that relates to one of my later points in the story. Um, Henry is another interesting character because he's kind of a vision of the future of Nelson, like someone who was quite obsessed with acting, and then he went to prison, a place where he could no longer get away with acting, like he had to be real, and that the reality of Collectors, the prison in which he was sent, kind of changed him forever. And so now, like, afterwards, outside of prison, he's unable to cope with the world. Like, like now, uh, like Henry, like, is constantly reminded of what happened with prison, and he tries to bury it down deep. And so much so that it affects his relationship with his divorced wife, with his child, with, with his friends Pata Larga. Like, every time he sees these people, just reminders of, of what happened in prison. And... It, it, it seems kind of like a vision of what's in store for Nelson because Henry was obsessed with acting too. And like in, in prison, like Nelson can't get away with that. Although one would argue that maybe he is. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but then there's also Ixta. Ixta is kind of presented as this kind of ice queen in the story. And 
uh, like at first it doesn't really make sense like you're like oh she's just a one-dimensional character but as more layers are revealed through the narration you learn so much more about Ixta like the reason she's acting this way about being so resistant being interviewed is because her name was dragged through the mud during the trial because everyone just said like oh like Ixta was cheating on Mendo with Nelson that's all she was but she wasn't trying to do that like she was trying to find a fully committed relationship with Nelson. But at the same time, she was leaving to be with Mendo because he was offering what Nelson couldn't. And although like Mendo and Ixta didn't really mesh in their chemistry or like they, there wasn't really a future for them, like she still loved him to some degree. And like Ixta, so, so, so Ixta is essentially torn between a future she sees with somebody who might not love her in the same way or a future like a future that she can't have with someone who she's incredibly passionate about and who she has a strong connection with. And there's so much there with Ixta and like the regret and the, you know, the sadness that she feels after the fact. Like it, her story like reveals a lot more about Nelson. But again, we're only seeing like her side of things. We're not really seeing anything from Nelson and that just makes the story all the more interesting. And then there's Padalarga who is kind of a reflection of Henry and that uh, he's on the path towards becoming alienated from his family because of his love of the theater. Uh, and like, But it does seem like he's kind of distancing himself away from that in a way that allows him to possibly reconnect with his family in the future. There's there's so much there with Padalarga, and I'll let you read it to, to find out more. But I love how Daniel Alarcon like, manages to to you know write such deep characters and also pull the rug out and be like you know th these are these are just from the perspective of the narrator who uh like might not present be presenting the, the the most truthful story um and again that's that leads me to my next point the fascinating third person narrator here the, um, the, the, because the, or not the third person, it's a first person narrator, but like they are a character in the story themselves, but they don't show up until much later and they have a minimal effect in the story. And at first I thought like, where is, where is the, is Elrakhan going with this? This doesn't quite make sense to me because like, like how, like, how are they going to play a role in this story? Like they have to play some role. And I, and I, I kept going and going and I'm like, oh, it suddenly makes sense. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I really like this, um, how the, the narrator comes into play in this story. Because as more layers are revealed, you're, you're wondering why they're interviewing these other people. And it seems like at first that Nelson might be dead. But then you find out later that Mendo is dead. And you're like, did Nelson kill Mendo? And so you, you, this is essentially like a, a magazine article that, it, uh, that is being written like about Nelson in the wake of him maybe or maybe not murdering somebody. And you don't find that out until later in the story. And it's so fascinating because uh, how Alarcon is able to reveal back the layers and keep you guessing until the end. It's such a wonderful way to write this story. I don't think I really encountered that in the past. Like there have been a lot of like third person narrators. Um, it reminds me a little bit of The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde by Juno Diaz. And you know, I like that book, although I do not like Juno Diaz because he is a noted abuser, of course. Uh, so like, I I'd say this is a better version of that. Uh, and it, it, it does, it plays with the, the idea of a, of a external narrator, uh, much more like, cleverly than I think uh, than I think that uh, the brief and wondrous life of Oscar Wilde does. But again, like you have to wonder how much of this story is true because you're being told this story from the perspective of the people who are around Nelson, who might have liked him uh, and might be willing to lie. Um, and they're also actors, so they're probably lying about that. Um, and how much does the narrator even know about Nelson? She met Nelson for like five minutes. That's all she's known about him. And she's hearing about him from other people. So she, the narrator doesn't truly know about Nelson. And that comes into play at the very end of the story. And so the, the, like the, the thing there is like, you have to wonder, like, is this an unreliable narrator? I talked about that, um, with what I believe, um, and, um, the Invisible Girl by uh, by Mary Shelley, like this week, uh, but it's also here too, and uh, I, I really find this story to be very fascinating because of how much like doubt it sows into and in, into you by the end of the story, because you begin to wonder, like, 
is somebody maybe not telling the truth, is somebody maybe misrepresenting the facts to make someone else look better. And I don't really know about that. We only have what the narrator is really saying to rely on and what the narrator says that the other characters say that we can rely on. And this all brings me back to my my, my next and ultimately the, the biggest theme of this entire story, which is theater versus reality. Uh, this the, uh, the idea that you know all the world is a stage and all the people merely players, as, as Shakespeare would say, versus the, the true, what is the case, what is really happening, what is the objective reality. And some people would argue that maybe all of life is theater because there is no objective reality. It's all subjective. But, you know, I'm not going to say that because I, in, the, in this story, let's pretend like there is a, a, a scenario where something actually happened. So, like... It really seems like, you know, you have the separate of theater and reality, and there's characters in this story who are mix, mixing up the two, whether intentionally or by accident, uh, because, like, they, they can't seem to distinguish between what um, what is theater and what is real, or, they're, or as the narrator says, they're rehearsing for the part, because a lot of uh, Nelson's friends, who are also actors, like, I, I, when she reached out to, you know, learn more about Nelson, it seemed like they were just telling her either what she wanted to hear or, like, embellishing details to, to provide or to prepare for a future role in case they were called upon to tell the life story of, of Nelson. Um, and so it really seems like what uh, Alarcon is getting at here is that life itself is a performance. Um, maybe, maybe the biggest part of the story that like, uh, that there is no like gap between the theater and the reality because all of it is just theater. And there's a good, um, a good point I would like to make to you. Henry ran his fingers through his hair and leaned forward, briefly animated, evidently pleased with the series of contradictory phrases. Did I get it? Did I understand? And I began to wonder if he saw it all as a performance. If that night, when the play ended and the attack began, when his past as represented by Jamie stood before him and his friends demanded answers, at that point, was he conscious of himself as a performer? I don't know, he said. Jaime kicked the shit out of me. I fell to the ground. I grabbed a plastic knife. I wanted to defend myself. I wanted someone to save me. Is this performing? And I, I think, um, you know a well-adjusted person could distinguish if they were performing or if they're merely acting in a, in a play because they view that the world is a is, is is a play or something like that. And it seems like Henry doesn't have that. And for the most extent, like maybe Nelson doesn't have that. And Patalarga is suffering from that too. Like Henry, for his part, like he still views himself as a player. Like there are roles to be played. And maybe as he's telling his side of the story, like he's telling the role of Nelson as the good guy rather than Nelson as he truly was. And so you can see the problem in there that like you're not getting an accurate view of Nelson because you're only getting the perception of what Henry thought Nelson was or should be. And you can see that this becomes a, a big problem for, for characters at multiple points in the story. Like, it becomes a problem in Nelson's relationship with, with Ixta because for the most part he seems to be acting. And, like, he, he's so obsessed with acting that, like, one, he, it, it seems to bleed into his relationship, but also it seems to be his only focus and goal in life. And he, may, maybe that's why Ixta feels the need she, or, or uh, believes that she can't commit to Nelson Foley, because if she does, like, how much of him is she truly going to get? Will he leave her eventually for, you know, the role of a lifetime or something like that? And it also becomes, like, a a, a problem in Collectors for Henry, but maybe also for Nelson, uh, because in Collectors, you can no longer act. Like, if you, you have to be real, and the people in that prison will sense if you're not being real and honest with them, and that might result in you getting beaten up or murdered or who knows what. And so this this collector seems like a place of honesty. And maybe perhaps that's why Henry can't adapt at the leaving prison, because now he's reminded that he's no longer living truthfully, that he can only out only outside of prison can he like can he escape and like become an actor and, and live in this this false reality that he's created and like every time he thinks of the prison he's just reminded that he's faking it like he's faking his way through everything 
And I, I like how Elarcon touches upon that. Maybe I'm overthinking it here, but there's a lot uh, that you could you could parse from from just looking at and, and examining El, our uh, collector's prison in this story. And this ultimately brings me to you know the the underlying thing about this entire story that this entire story might be theater itself. As I mentioned earlier, like how much of the story is true? It really seems like based on what I've read, based on how the story is told, that Elarcon might be getting at the fact that this story is is theater. Like this this entire like narration uh tool, this entire like retelling of the events of Nelson's life are told in a way are told in a biased way that makes it so this is just theater. Like Nelson is a character in a story and he's playing a role that the narrator has assigned to him or who the narrator has allowed others to assign to him based on their their five minute like interaction in the past. Um, maybe the narrator doesn't know that they're doing this, but they, they quickly find out by the end of the story. Like, it just seems like a summary of character motivations for why Nelson couldn't have possibly been the murderer. Like, everything is leading up to the ultimate conclusion that Nelson isn't a murderer. And Nelson points this out at the end of the story. Like, he, 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 he asked, like, how do you know that I'm not the murderer? And there's a beautiful quote that I would like to read to you. What if I did kill Mendo? Have you thought about that? There was something very cold in his voice. You didn't. What if I did? What if I were that kind of person? Nelson had been inside for 30 odd months, studying his very sort of performed aggression. And he was good. He let that questions hang there. I knew it couldn't be true, but then he shifted his gaze and part of me wondered why I thought that. Why I was so sure. I felt chill. All right, I said, let's suppose. And it goes on from there where essentially Nelson, you know, bullies her into giving over her equipment and, uh, and you know, demands like her to just leave the prison. Uh, and there's a point where Nelson is saying, like, do you understand what's going on here? Like, do you see what is happening here? And the narrator is like, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Like, um, because... Uh, Nelson notes like he may be stealing her equipment like her recording equipment but she stole something from him and I think what this all means it could mean two things the first is that Nelson has gotten so good at acting that he's acting in prison and this is all a facade as a way to um, to ultimately cope with the reality of being in prison unlike Henry Nelson was able to do it uh, and perhaps that's like the ultimate like detriment for Nelson is that he's become so enamored or like enmeshed in this role that he's he's fell victim to you know being unable to perceive what is reality and what is not. But I think the other aspect of this story is that the narrator like spent so long telling this story and we didn't once hear from Nelson and so what Nelson is saying is you've stolen the ability of me to tell my own story uh, you've relied on Henry and Ixta and Monica his mother and all these other people but you never once asked me like my side of things I could be the murderer for all you know and you would be none the wiser. You got into this prison cell with someone who could very well be a murderer and who could leave you for dead in, in one of the most harshest prisons um, in South America, and you didn't truly know what happened. And you told a story where I played a certain character, and it's just, it's so brilliant because it upends this entire story in a brilliant way. Like, I'm sorry, I, I keep going on about it, but it's, it's, so, it's such a powerful ending to this story because... We don't know if Nelson actually killed Mindo. We only know what the narrator has been telling us based on the what the people have been telling her. And she's like, well, surely Nelson couldn't have committed a murder because I have his journals. I've heard from his family. But that you haven't heard from the one person who could tell you if a murder took place or not. And again, I'm saying it like it upends the entire story. It brings new meaning to the story. And I feel like I haven't been challenged in that way in quite some time. And damn it, I love I love this story so much. So like I feel like that's like like 
it's it's the moment the story like truly connected with me because I was wondering like where is Elrond going with this narration thing and then like we got to the prison and like I was reading I was like damn oh my god like I know what he's doing now and it's just like it's it's so amazing so I I can't say enough good things about that anyway we're 31 minutes into this video now as I record and yeah that's that's what I gotta say about uh, at night we walk in circles a fabulous book probably gonna show up on my year end list on a on a year that's been packed full of really good books this one stands out um, so definitely recommend it to you like absolutely if, if you read if you can only read like three books this year that I recommend make sure this is one of them because it's so good like it'll, it'll challenge you it'll make you think and you know it's it, it was a breeze to get through like I, I was I, I most books are sometimes a struggle but this was a real breeze to get through so it's an easy read and also a very challenging read and two different kind of senses of, of those words. So if you read this before, I definitely recommend you leave a comment and tell me what you thought of it or simply comment on my review. Um, let's have a conversation about At uh, Night We Walk in Circles. Otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that more people can find out about this author and this book. I would really like to spread the word about this. And until then, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and acting travels. Farewell.